Okay, welcome everybody. See a lot of people rolling in. Thank you for joining us this evening or afternoon or early morning, depending on where you're at. See a few more people trickling in. Numbers keep going up. And for those of you on YouTube, welcome as well. Nice to see y'all. All right, still a few people, it's still going up. I'm gonna give us just a few more minutes and I'm gonna get started here. We started right on time this time. That's usually, <laughs> it's usually a rarity. We were ready. Oli and I were ready for this. Hey, everybody. Gonna get started in a few minutes. A few seconds. All right, okay, we're slowing down a little bit. Okay, all right. Excellent, right, okay, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome back to Fermentology if you've been a longtime supporter or welcome if this is your first time and you saw Olia talking about this series and you're tuning in for the first time ever, welcome, you're in great company. Uh, my name is Michelle Jewell. I'm the science communicator at NC State's Department of Applied Ecology based in Raleigh, North Carolina. And this is a series that we've been putting on since last April, which I cannot believe um, But we've had hosts come on and chefs and historians and, and loads of people interested in ferment, fermentation join us to speak about the process from their corner of the world. And all of those talks are available on our YouTube page. If you wanna check it out, any of the previous recordings, feel free to look up Applied Ecology on YouTube and they will come up too. So today we have an extremely special guest, as I'm sure you can see, um, chef and author Olya Hercules is going to be sharing her knowledge of traditional fermented Ukrainian foods and take us kind of on a journey through the summer kitchen recipes um, that are some of her favorites as well and common in that part of the world too. We will have a Q&A afterwards, a few questions. So as you have questions, please just throw them in the chat, either the Q&A box or the chat box in Zoom, or if you're watching on YouTube, throw it in the chat there as you have them. And I'll ask Olia a few questions uh, at the end, just kind of pick out and see who's got the same type of um, question going on there. So without any further ado, I will turn everything over to Olia. Thank you so much for joining us. I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That. We're good. We're Sorry. good. We're good. Hi, uh, we're good. We can do this. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. It's um, so lovely to be a part of this series. So today I want to talk to you about fermentation from a Ukrainian uh, cook's perspective, basically. Um, so uh, from a Ukrainian home cook, even. So I was born in the south of Ukraine in 1984, uh, ended up in the UK and um, didn't actually really start cooking until my late, late 20s, but eventually retrained and became a chef. And funnily enough, every time I would go back uh, to Ukraine, especially since I've written my first uh, cookbook, and you know, fermentation here in the UK became a real kind of like trend and a buzzword, you know. And I'd come back home and whenever I would mention fer the word fermentatia, um, fermentation in Ukrainian to my mom or my auntie or whatever, you know, they'd just laugh in my face. Because of course to us, you know, it's, I didn't, I wasn't even really aware of it because it was just such a normal kind of like, it was just the fabric of everyday life, you know, this kind of stuff. Uh, it was just something that everybody did and I, I wasn't really conscious of it. So whenever I'd say this fermentatia, they'd be like, ha ha ha, you know. In Ukraine, uh, we use the word kvashenya, which just means to make things sour. And that's what people have been doing for, well, hundreds of years, I suppose. Um, and my experience of it, uh, sort of like my, one of my first kind of like childhood memories would be... Um, probably August, September, closest to September. And there'd be these, uh, you know, almost like a pickling operation happening in the summer kitchen. I'll quickly explain what a summer kitchen is. So I, I wrote a book about it. Um, in all over Ukraine, there are these little uh, outhouses almost that people built. Uh, so you've got your main house, 
house and then there, you've got a separate little house which sounds glamorous but it's you know it's literally just one room inside and that room is a kitchen and there people cook all throughout the summer they do their everyday cooking etc it's usually positioned a little bit closer to your i say garden patch but really people have small holdings like it's a big vegetable patch and in these kitchens apart from just doing your day-to-day -day cooking you would also be doing all of the pickling so like this really huge operation in um in the summer uh, especially in september once you've kind of like you've got your glut of vegetables of fruit and of course you know we lived very seasonally so you couldn't just pop into a supermarket in the winter and pick up a tomato you know you had to um preserve everything that you would have grown and of course uh, we had this you know delicious fermented food all throughout winter and um well, with summer kitchens um i've got this the first um chapter is actually called the september sessions and uh, it, it, you know, it's a strange thing to open a book with a pickling chapter because normally you'd go from your breakfast to whatever and then cakes and then at the end maybe you'll get a little bit of pickling. But to us it's, um, it's such a central thing and such a central thing to this uh, tradition of summer kitchens that I've put it at the front. Um, so for this book, I've traveled all over Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is huge, it's, kind of, it's bigger than France even, um, and uh, kind of traveled from region to region to find um, recipes and people's stories. And of course, Ukraine is actually extremely diverse. You know, people will always say, oh, it's all about potatoes and um, dumplings and cabbages, which are great, all of those things, and they do exist, of course, but it's also a very varied, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a varied culture. And, and, eat, and eating culture as well, uh, very diverse, but they all have the summer kitchen in common. And they also have all of these wonderful pickles. I'm just going to kind of like show you some pictures from the book and um, show you different pickles from different regions and just talk about them a little bit. And then um, I, I also want to tell you a little bit about how we use those pickles, because of course we use them simply um, as an addition to your meal, you know, a pickle on the side, but we also use them to cook with. And um, ever since uh, kind of becoming um, a, a professional cook, etc., you know, I found many more ways of using them in, uh, in ridiculous. So I'm just going to quickly share a screen and show you some pictures. Uh, hopefully this works. Is this all good? Yeah, can we see it? Okay. So the first one is, of course, you know, that's our gherkins, you know, just pickled cucumbers. It's, um, it's one of the most common things. Um, we've got some dill umbrellas in there. And of course, it's just a brine. You know, it's uh, nowadays I use maybe a 5% brine. In Ukraine, it may be a little bit saltier than that, actually. And um, uh, the way that we make pickles, it can be very fast. Like uh, in the summer, my dad, that's my dad's favorite. He just does like a tea ferment. And they're still kind of like semi-fresh with just a little bit of bite. But me and my mom, uh-uh-uh, we love them. We go, we like to go nuclear, as we call it, with them. We like we like them when they're like, ah, make contort your face. And of course, um, there's plenty of things that you can do with the brine and with the cucumbers itself. I'll tell you in a little bit when we um, go down the list. Now, of course, you've got crab. That's another kind of like super um, widespread thing. And uh, we usually actually add some grated or uh, matchstick kind of like julienne carrot into it as well. And a little bit of sugar my mom adds. And of course, back in the day, um, what my grandmother would do, for example, she would also put, you know, the tougher leaves that you've got on the white cabbage, she would put them underneath, um, uh, underneath all of the kraut. And of course, by the end, uh, you know, once you've finished your barrel or whatever, you, you've got these really wonderful whole leaves. And of course, they would also be used uh, as, uh, you know, for stuffing. So you stuff those uh, leaves as you would with holopki, as they call them in Poland, or holopti, as we call them in Ukraine. And it's a super delicious thing. I will tell you about this dish in, in a little while again. Um, then we've got, this is from Transcarpathia, but uh, this kind of uh, a pickle is made uh, in quite a few regions of Ukraine. So these are, again, this is white cabbage, uh, which was kind of like cut into quite big kind of chunks, uh, like pyramid chunks almost. And then we've got some horseradish in there and some bay leaf and some beetroot. And again, it's a brine, but also there is a dash of vinegar in there as well. 
I think it's more of a modern addition, like people in the past didn't used to use vinegar. But I find that actually for those who, who are just starting fermenting and you know, it's, you're doing it for the first time, it does stabilize it a little bit and doesn't let it go too crazy. Although I do, when, whenever I do use vinegar in, in this ferment, I try to use raw vinegar. So it's all kind of like becomes funky and delicious. And again, there's a bit of sugar in there. Um, so it's, it's a super, super tasty one. I love this uh, pickle so much. Then we've got uh, uh, chilies, uh, chilies with quite a lot of lovage, I think, or celery in here. Um, and this is uh, on the inside of a summer kitchen. In the, in the background, you see some more, so we'll get to that in a sec. This is fermented tomato pulp. And again, a very simple brine, uh, whatever flavorings that you like, whole chili peppers. Um, and what I personally like to do with them, once they're really nice and fermented and soft, what I do is um, they kind of like detach themselves from the papery skins. And then I just kind of squeeze it out and, and blitz it and make this delicious fermented um, uh, chili sauce, basically, essentially, like a Ukrainian sriracha almost. Um, and the leaves, uh, the celery leaves and the celery itself becomes really tasty also. Uh, now these are fantastic, they're fermented aubergines. And they, this kind of tradition comes from mainly from the south of Ukraine and also closer to the Romanian and Moldovan border. And what you do is you slash uh, the raw aubergine. Actually, first you, uh, you boil them. So you boil them until they're kind of soft, about 20 minutes or so. Um, and then you drain them, you slash them, and then you've got this really beautiful mix. The traditional, more of a traditional mix is just uh, actually cooked out carrot, uh, caramelized carrot and onions, which is an interesting thing to be adding to your ferments. You just think, oh, it, you know, vegetables have to go in raw, but actually not at all. With something like this, it's, it's really nice to add this kind of like sofrito almost uh, vibe to it. But here, my friend Katria from um, my hometown, Kahovka, she, um, we've got some garlic, chili and mint in here, all fresh, all kind of like blitzed up into this rough paste. And then you uh, stuff these um, kind of like slightly opened, you know, they're still joined by the stem, but you've got the openings there. And then you uh, stuff it with, with your flavorings and then press them down. They will release enough of their own liquid or they should, but you can always add a little bit of brine and they are delicious. Um, you leave them, they take about three months or so. So, you know, perfect, glut of aubergine um, in August. Uh, you make this and then in winter, you've got this really tasty thing. Now these, I found, uh, this recipe I found in a uh, village uh, near the city of Poltava, which is central Ukraine, and it was a complete revelation to me because my grandma or mom uh, never made these. So these are apples, and they, are, they were fermented in uh, pumpkin puree. So what they do, it, actually, Ukrainians don't really like pumpkin that much. <laughs> I read a really interesting um, essay about it, how we really, because it grows so fast and, and so easily, we're, we're not interested. It's like, it's too easy to grow, you know, whatever, just give it to the pigs, you know. But um, so you, there's a picture in some of the kitchens where there's this car, basically, like a parked car, and underneath there's just like loads of massive pumpkins strewn around. I don't know. Uh, anyway, it does have a use in this beautiful uh, ferment. So what is done is you get a really nice pumpkin and you boil it or cook it in whichever way you want. You just basically just need to get a cooked puree and then you add some salt to make a, you know, three, four percent kind of like pumpkin brine, essentially of a puree brine. And then you just stick whole apples into it. Uh, here in London, I think Golden Delicious we use, uh, but a couple of French varieties are good too. They look yellow. They're yellow and with slight kind of speckles. I find that for this recipe, the original, kind of the closest to what they use in Ukraine works best. And what you do, you just put them into the pumpkin puree. And of course, you know, the woman that I uh, told me about this recipe in her summer kitchen, um, she was like, I always start my questions with, you know, what are the recipes that perhaps your mom or your grandma used to cook it, but you know, you, you kind of stopped cooking or something and something interesting. And she did, she was like, Oh, what's interesting. What's interesting. Luckily there was her grandson uh, right next to her. And he was just like, well, grandma, don't you remember those apples in the pumpkin puree? And she said, is this interesting? And, you know, I'm like, yes, please, please tell me about this. This is very interesting. So she just basically just described the dish without any measurements or anything. So I kind of had to develop this recipe. 
And um, so I've put it all in, I've put the apples in, I put it into the puree and I left it in my kitchen. And I actually, I don't know, I think I was so nervous about it not working or something that I kind of just left it there. I didn't even put it into a cold place or anything. It was just in my, I mean, it was winter time. So it was kind of cold in my kitchen, but not, you know, the ultimate kind of fermentation temperature that you'd want. Um, and I kind of left them there for three months. And then eventually I decided to check up on them. And I was like, oh, I, 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 we have to shoot these apples. Like I have to see if it's actually worked. And I opened it up and it was so interesting. They were just like really tiny little bubbles going. So it was definitely alive, but it was very kind of like subdued and lovely. And I thought, ooh, this is exciting. So I got it out and, um, and that's it. And you can see that even after three months, you've got this really f uh, fresh, mid like uh, right next to the pips you've got the white flesh and that still tasted like almost like raw apple and all around it was really delicious and slightly fizzy and you know fermented tasting they were really tasty the ones on the bottom uh turned into mush but it was such delicious mush and actually you know in ukraine weirdly i think the pumpkin again i hate the pumpkin <laughs> that would be you know it's done its job that's it we'll just like feed it to the pigs um but it was delicious and um what i did was i blitzed the uh, apples that fell apart with the pumpkin puree and it was really really tasty with pork or with any like roasted cauliflower or whatever it was just a like, really really tasty puree that would cut through um, any fatty or whatever rich dishes that you've got just a little bit more seasoning or something uh, and any fla other flavorings of your but it's great it's I think it's one of my favorite kind of like discoveries it, it almost had like a berry flavor because the pumpkin gave some of its flavor to the apples and the apples exchanged and gave its flavor to the pumpkin puree it was just fantastic I highly recommend that you uh, try this one and then this is um, what we call morse in Ukraine in Russia um, morse the word morse is used for a berry drink interestingly but in Ukraine um, we call fermented tomato puree morts. And what you do is you can either blitz your tomatoes straight away and just ferment them in this form. But what, what uh, you know, my family does is you kind of almost tear or, you know, cut your tomatoes and kind of like squ squash them a little bit and add, uh, you know, an uh, amount of salt per tomatoes, whatever, you know, you just kind of like make it up, I guess. I, uh, people really don't measure things very much. You just like, you just know how much to put in. So you, you put the salt in, you mix it together, cover if it's summer, like I would cover it with something so the so your insects can't get in there, obviously. And then you just leave it for a couple of days. And if it's hot, like within a, a day or two, they'll be already kind of like bubbling up a little bit. And then uh, you use it in so many wonderful things. Um, you can use it to make a sauce. You can use it, traditionally it's used to add sourness to borscht. Um, so especially to a winter borscht, uh, you would add a little bit of this uh, tomato pulp. But I think in modern cooking, you can find so many wonderful uses for this kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's a really cool thing. You have to kind of like watch it because after a while, if you don't put it into a cold place, um, it can become quite alcoholic. So you don't want this to happen. Ditto with the apples, by the way. So just watch out. <laughs> don't turn it into alcohol. And then these are amazing. I love these so much. So again, uh, closer to Moldovan and Romanian border, uh, where my actually two of my great grandmothers were from. Uh, it's called the Bessarabia region of um, Ukraine. Um, and it's kind of like, if you know where Odessa is by the Black Sea, it's... Um, it's west to the west, a couple of hours to the west. And um, these are fermented peppers. And again, you make a kind of a sofrito with uh, onion and um, carrot. So you just uh, sweat it down with a little bit of oil and then you mix it with uh, chopped cabbage, with chopped white cabbage. So you kind of like massage it. We never do kind of like much pummeling with any with any blunt objects or anything. My mom is just like, I showed her once. I was like, don't you just use like this pestle and She's like, no she's just like you go with your hands and like wow well, yes she's strong um but you you know just lightly massage it it's fine you don't have to go crazy with it and then you just stuff these peppers basically and again you just put them into a large jar or your fermentation crock or whatever you're using and uh put some uh brine in again four five percent brine works really nicely and then whatever else you've got lying around if you've got some cherry tomatoes or you've got some garlic cloves or celery or even little cucumbers like people just put like a jumble of things in there 
uh, always with uh, dill seeds and maybe some allspice berries as well. Um, and then you, again, you just leave it for a few days in the warm kitchen until it starts fermenting. And then you just, you know, in your grain, you take it down to a cellar. And then they, it's a really, really tasty kind of like pickle. I love it very, very much. Um, and these are a little bit more unusual. So these, this is uh, uh, Fisalis, which I, rec I guess in America, Tomatillo is its uh, cousin, the, the Mexican Tomatillo, um, which I, I've done it here in the UK, so I couldn't find any Fisalis. So I've tested the recipe using Tomatillos. And you would ferment them in exactly the same way as you would tomatoes. Uh, so you just pop them into a brine and put whatever flavorings you want. And then you get this really delicious, uh, like, you know, it pops in your in your mouth. My mom calls them champagne tomatoes. Um, just a really, really tasty uh, pickle as on its own. Or you can also dice it up and make a little salsa. Uh, and it works really, really well. Uh, now we've got these guys. So in Ukraine, we ferment everything, you know, <laughs> everything we find, it was just, we just ferment it, whatever you've got a glut of. And of course, in, in the South where I'm from, it's super hot there in the summer. We've got these, uh, you know, watermelons everywhere. Uh, after the Second World War, for example, there was a shortage, big shortage of sugar, but there was enough watermelon. So people started making this thing called bikmes, uh, where you take watermelon pulp, get rid of the seeds, and you just basically, like you would do with pomegranate molasses, people used to put it into these massive pots outside uh, and over fire with like a gnaw of a spoon. You just like reduce it down. No sugar, obviously, added. It's just uh, watermelon juice reduced into this what we call yeah big mess or watermelon honey and they and that's what people used in their like sweet baking and stuff and it's um uh, really interesting i did it once so I, I had like 20 kilos of these massive watermelons uh we got about 14 liters of juice out of it and then we got about 500 milliliters of this watermelon honey and uh, the and the flavor was amazing because um it actually started smelling and tasting of pumpkin by by the end so interesting, but yeah, so these are fermented watermelons. Normally, traditionally, they would be in massive wooden barrels. These days, people just put them into whatever containers they've got, and you just put them in whole. You just make some holes in it. Sometimes you put them into uh, a bro just a brine and then keep them there for about three, four, four, four months. Um, and sometimes people make a brine out of the watermelon juice. So you'd get the small watermelons that you'll have would be actually put in whole. And then the big ones, you'd, you know, uh, get the pulp out, uh, to, you know, get the juice out and then mix it with salt and put that over the watermelons. And uh, in Ukraine, you just eat them as a pickle, as a bit of a vodka chaser, basically. But interestingly enough, and I thought, and you know, it was a bit of a wild card, card recipe. I'm like, who the hell is going to ferment watermelons in the UK or the US or whatever? Um, you know, my granddad, for example, used to actually ferment them in the bathtub uh, outside. So outside they had, weirdly, they had this big bathtub and he would fill it with little watermelons and then pour brine over and that's how he would do it like cover it with something so the insects don't get there but yeah interesting but so um a really great uh, couple in california actually andrew chung and his partner um they fermented one watermelon in the bucket i was so proud of them it was such a fun lovely thing and they made some cocktails with it i, I believe margaritas or something um so you know why not yes if it's a vodka chaser in ukraine why not why not make a um a great cocktail tell out of it so hopefully some people will make you know will make use of this recipe and and try it it's cool it's it's an it is probably an acquired taste um you know but i love it it's it's a little bit salty a little bit sweet um and overall really pleasing and the rind obviously is edible and really delicious uh, this is just a quick uh, thing. This is not obviously a vegetable or a fruit. This is actually baked milk. I don't know if um, uh, our audience today have heard of Ryazhenka, which is a, um, a ferment, a, a baked milk kind of like uh, yogurt, essentially. So what you do is you uh, put your, if you can get obviously raw milk, that's the best kind of thing. Um, if not uh, unhomogenized is good. And then you would um, put it in the oven, a low oven. Uh, I don't know what in Fahrenheit it would be kind of like, I would say a hundred degrees Celsius or something, maybe just a little bit over. And, um, and you put it in the oven and leave it. And I just leave it overnight. And in the morning you wake up and you've got this delicious crust that uh, that's, 
create it on top and we just chop that up and you know have it in in your breakfast or whatever and then underneath you'd have this really beautiful caramel colored milk and what you do is uh, we would get a couple of big spoonfuls of smetana which is a basically like a ukrainian creme fraiche um obviously it's a live culture so you would cover it you know uh, traditionally a big sheep skin coat or something granddad's sheepskin coat or something you'd cover the uh, the pot with it and then the next day you've got this yogurt which is naturally sweet because obviously all of the uh you know uh, milk has caramelized the, the solid the milk solids are caramelized within the milk so it's yeah really really tasty thing now uh recently in ukraine by, by recently i mean you know probably since soviet times uh people stopped kind of keeping ferments over winter like sometimes they did even even in my mom's uh, youth they probably did they had just barrels of this and barrels of that and because there's such a big volume you know it doesn't just over ferment so quickly and, and in the cellars it'll be quite cold people started fermenting recently and then they can it so obviously they ferment it get it to the stage where the flavor is quite pleasing to them and then they kill the fermentation process by boiling everything and then they just put it into jars and can it and this way it's because people as i say like when i was little we had no idea about the health benefits absolutely no idea we with you know for to us it was just like oh it, you know pickles like my, oh, my mom would be would say oh stop eating you know too many gherkins or whatever there's salt in it because in the 80s everybody thought that salt was the enemy so we had absolutely no idea and what people got used to and really loved was the flavor i think so you know um, yeah, you just boil it off, put it in a, in a in a jar, and seal it, and it will last you for a couple of years, really. <laughs> but um, but people still do have barrels and do that kind of stuff, um, but less and less. So I'm afraid. Okay, and just quickly through some recipes. So this is kind of like a dandy uh, cousin of bigos, I suppose. Uh, it's my mom's recipe. So originally, I think she used something like a pork knuckle, but here I've got pork belly. And it's um, pork belly roasted on a bed of kraut. And the kraut has been mixed with some apples and some, uh, some raw apples and onions, some prunes, some uh, dried apricots, uh, caraway seed, coriander seed. So it's super aromatic and delicious. And obviously all of the pork fat gets cooked into the kraut. Oh, it's, it's a really nice dish. Um, this is, again, a soup that we make closer to the Romanian and Mold Moldovan border um, and it's a, uh, another interesting thing so I haven't talked about class of course we make beetroot class all, all over Ukraine and use it in um, again to add color and sourness to borscht etc but um, near the Moldovan border they make a confusingly a fermented liquid which is called borscht as well which which is not you know of course it's not a soup but it's also called borscht and it's a um, you basically get some maize flour and then you uh, mix it uh, with some, you make kind of like a mush with a little bit of water, let it ferment, almost like you would be making a, a, a sourdough starter or something like that. And then you would dilute it, you know, you'd add warm water to it and then uh, some lovage and some other flavorings. And basically you'd get this fermented maize water essentially. And it's used quite a lot to add sourness to different dishes, including this uh, chicken soup with homemade noodles and mushrooms and chicken. Um, and then this is uh, called Dohirkivka in Ukrainian. And this is when I mentioned that we use um, gherkins in soups. So in Russia, in Russia they've got rasolnik, uh, which is, normally made with pork kind of like pork rib stock and pearl barley or something or or buckwheat and then at the end you would grate the uh, gherkins and also add a bit of the gherkin juice at the end of cooking to add you know to cut through the fat and add this really delicious sourness and this is a vegetarian version in the book which is called Dohirkivka and it's like a mushroom a rich mushroom broth again with uh, pearl barley and instead of grating the gherkin I've sliced it which worked really nicely so it's a really great and that's of course creme fraiche on a big rye bread <laughs> because we, well, yeah we love creme fraiche so much um and you know the leaves that i mentioned before the um cabbage leaves that we keep underneath all the kraut well this is a really old recipe of my grandma and i don't know why it went off the radar by the time i kind of came along she 
never really made it anymore. So it, was, it, ha it has this like legendary feel to it. My mom always talked about it, but um, I've, I've never tasted my grandma's version. So from my mom's stories, I've kind of recreated it. Um, and it's the fermented cabbage leaves, uh, which are actually quite soft by the time they've been there for a couple of months or so. And then um, I've actually uh, cooked some pork, you know, it's, it's leftover kind of like pulled pork essentially um, and some grains. So I think I've got, again, I've got pearl, pearl barley here. And then you mix them together, season it really well, wrap it in the leaves, and then you make a sauce with mushroom stock uh, and um, creme fraiche, again, and loads of garlic and butter. And then you basically pour this sauce over them. And then if you have one, a uh, wood-fired oven, that's kind of the traditional way of doing it. And this is where this has been done, but it can be done in the normal oven as well. And then you just put it in. And when you put it in, like it's full of sauce and you think, oh my bloody hell, like what's going to happen with all this, there's too much liquid, but they absorb all of that sauce. And in the end they get like really, but like um, kind of like a little bit burnt on top, which is just, it's such a delicious dish. I really, really love it. And finally, um, again, what to do with your ferments. So I've got my fermented apple here. I've got a little bit of the gherkin, fermented gherkin. I've got some kraut in there too. It's like a salad. You can also add a little bit of um, a fresh apple for, for to add a little bit of freshness and a bit of shallot or thinly sliced onion and a bit of something kind of like quite toasty uh, flavored oil. So we use unrefined sunflower oil in Ukraine and, uh, but sesame oil or something like would work really well too. And it's, um, yeah, it's just like a really nice winter slaw essentially. Um, yeah, so this is kind of like an overview of uh, the things that I really have loved in the, you know, all my life and in the last couple of years. And um, I really hope that you enjoyed um, while listening um, and can try it yourselves as well. Absolutely, we enjoyed listening. Thank you so much. It's brilliant. I'm so inspired to go out there and just. I need to put a watermelon in a bucket. And I know, it. right? Like you got. Just, you got to do it. Do it this summer. Like it's. I have to do it, it can be done. That's great. <laughs> and we do have a few questions in here, and I'll I'll give you guys um, just a little bit of time to go ahead and throw your questions into the chat or the Q and A. But a few people had questions about your temperature management. So right say you're working in a place that's really, really hot, like North Carolina can get, well, mm. how do you manage that with your fermentation process? Uh, right, so you just have to kind of watch it. And as soon as you see, like, because in Ukraine as well, in the summer, it gets super, super hot. So I've never seen, in, if my mom was doing it in the summer kitchen or whatever, two days max, it would be there. Sometimes even like a day and a half. And then as soon as you can see bubbles and stuff's happening, and of course you taste it, and if it tastes good to you and it's come to that sour level that you are with, you know, for those gherkins, maybe I'll leave it for days. Thank you very much longer before I put it in the cellar. And then as soon as you're happy with how it tastes, put it in the fridge. Okay. You know, not, not everybody obviously has a cellar these days, uh, but, but fridge is absolutely fine. Um, so yeah. And then you can keep it there for a few months. And of course it will still keep fermenting, but um you know what I found uh, very quickly, actually, I wanted to mention this, mm -hmm. what I found quite hard when I started fermenting here in the UK, um, when I started cooking away from my mom, basically, I, in Ukraine, they just put everything into kind of like big, to, to start the fermentation, they put it into big tubs, and she would put like a gauze over it, you know, like a muslin cloth or something. And that's what I did as well. And every time I would get mold and like, like it just wouldn't work. And I was just like, what is happening? And actually then um, there was this, I had this uh, talk on the radio with uh, Sander and Cassandra Katz was one of the panelists. And I actually asked him and I said, you know, what, what is going on? Can you tell me? And he's like, look, you are, you know, probably where your mom is, you've got this almost like a microbiome, like if they're fermenting all the time and got all of this stuff going on and probably in the countryside as well, you know, you've got all of these wild yeasts and everything all around you. And if you're in the London flat and, you know, at that point, I probably didn't really understand that you really shouldn't over sanitize stuff. You know, I'd probably be like, oh, it's pickling. So I must, you know, really sterilize this jar. <laughs> it's like don't use chemicals like don't don't use um, you know really hard detergents or you know of course like wash your jar and like put some hot water of it or whatever but 
you can actually overdo it and then you get all of the bad bacteria coming in. Uh, but now uh, I've got a bit of a microbiome now happening in my house, luckily, but my, my, my husband is also doing uh, brewing from scratch. So he, he's like crazy uh, fermenter uh, with the brewing stuff. So that's all good, but I still put them into a jar and kind of like put a lid over them, I think, and then just do the whole opening it, it from time to time. Not with my apples, I just left them there and they were fine. They didn't explode. <laughs> Between your fermentation and your husband's brewing, I want to come stay for a while. That sounds like <laughs> yeah, please stop. Good. We've missed people. <laughs> yeah, no. One day. Um, another question related to the the temperature, and you touched on it a little bit, but that the process of cooking with these ferments does that right. do anything to that good bacteria? Does yeah, that... yeah, of course it kills it <laughs> completely. Like it's gone. Yeah. Like kiss it goodbye. Right. Unfortunately. What, what you can do, like, if obviously, like, if you add it at the very end and it's not boiling, like, maybe something will survive, but then, I don't know, it's, it's for, as I said before, like, for us, we weren't really aware of the health benefits, and the main uh, love and, like, the main thing that we value about them is flavor, so, right. you know, yeah, if you add the gherkin juice into the soup, it's bye-bye good bacteria, but you know, it's still delicious. So it's fine. Just have like a little gherkin, a, a little fresh uncooked gherkin <laughs> on the side to like help your microbiome and then you're going to be fine. <laughs> Related to gherkins. So I don't know if you can answer this question, but I'm going to go ahead and try. Let's try. What is your favorite pickle? <gasps> oh my God, that is a hard one. <laughs> oh no. Like a pickle that I would take to a deserted island type thing. Yeah, yes. What's the pickle that you would take to the deserted island? <laughs> oh my God. Oh no, I've just made it like even harder. Okay. I don't know. I think definitely the whole fermented tomato situation is, you know, because you can do so much with that. You can kind of like turn it and turn them into a drink. You can use them as a salad. You can make a tomato sauce. They're kind of versatile. And also just the flavor and the freshness of them is so good. But then another one, the one that I actually, in my practical life, use the most is kraut. Mm. Absolutely, 100% kraut. Mm. And I'm working on this new recipe that, because, you know, with lockdown and homeschooling one kid and then having like a baby as well, <laughs> which has been mad. Uh, you know, all of the, like, massage, my mom's massaging. I'm, no more. I'm not doing it anymore. You know what? I'm, I'm going to tell you this. Okay, I'm not allowed to release this recipe yet. It's in my phone book. <laughs> but don't do the, any pummeling. Don't do any massaging. You you just you just cut it quite like thinly, mm -hmm. and then make a brine with a bit of salt and honey. Actually, so I've used honey instead of uh, sugar. And then mm. you just pour it over. You just pour the brine over the chopped cabbage. Like it obviously is going to be quite nicely like tightly packed into the jar. And you put the brine and put the holes and just make sure that there's no air pockets. And it comes out really it was it's been like our lockdown go-to recently i've got like a whole i got myself a really little fridge which is now the fermentation fridge and it's all <laughs> full of this honey crowd i highly recommend it that's awesome that sounds great i'm gonna have to give that a try i'll go for it and i'll give you one last question there's so many questions in there a lot of people are asking if these recipes are in the, the your book Yes, I'm that's yep. That's it. I'm I'm kitchen, a, and it's available in the U.S. This is, in fact, the U.S. edition. I think <laughs> I threw a link in the chat. So for those of you who want these recipes, they're in there. And um, the last question I ask you is about that puree process that you were talking yeah. about. Is it always pumpkin puree? Have other purees been used before? Uh, this is the only puree that I have encountered, actually, especially with this apple situation. I'll tell you very quickly, though, uh, another um, way that apples and plums... Oh, I didn't add the plum picture. I was going to talk about that. Um, so apart from the puree, another thing that is used or used to be used a lot in Ukraine traditionally is um, straw. So you'd get kind of like uh, oat and rye, I guess, straw, you know, the, the nice stuff, like not the dusty stuff on the road, like make sure that it's kind of nice and clean. And then you would get your, either your plums, and this is very specific, we call it worka, which is like a Hungarian plum. I'm, I'm not sure what the American equivalent is, uh, but you get these plums and you would um, layer them in your barrel with uh with the straw in between and of course the straw eventually will give you some flavor as well i think it, it would have been done so they don't get bruised or something mm -hmm. and then you pour the brine over 
And the same with apples, sometimes also add mint spray, sprigs into the apple and hay situation and the straw situation. And it's, it comes out really well as well. Like oh, a really wow. interesting uh, old recipe. Yeah. Wow. Well, there you go. Even more reason <laughs> to get that book. <laughs> there you go. Um, but Olya, thank you so much. There are tons more questions. I can't get to everybody, unfortunately. Um, but you can find Olya everywhere. She's on Twitter. She's on Instagram. I'm on Instagram on Olya Herc at Olya Hercules. So uh, please do. There's a uh, my last post is where it has that salad, the fermented salad on. So just uh, put your question there, and I will make sure to answer. Uh, awesome. I always do. It's awesome. Been such a pleasure. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going to just quickly plug uh, the next talk that is actually next week. You were saying don't make alcohol with your ferments on accident. We are going to be talking about alcoholic ferments. We're kicking off March Meadness next <gasps> week, where we're going to be doing everything mead. And on March 4th, um, archaeologist and author Neil Rush is going to beam in from South Africa. He's going to be talking about the first times humans intentionally fermented foods 40,000 years ago. Spoiler alert, that's to do with bees, bee bread, mead, etc. So make sure you tune in for that one. Otherwise, Olya, thank you so much again for beaming in tonight and sharing. Thank you so much. Expertise. I'll be joining those talks as an audience. <laughs> <Awesome>. <laughs> Great. All right, we'll see you all then. Thank you very much. Bye, guys. Thank, thank you, guys.